Hello everybody. I want to show you a game from round two of the Tata Steel Chess Tournament uh, between um, GM Adiban with the white pieces and Magnus Carlsen with the black pieces. So let's get right into it. Game started out E4, E5, Knight F3, Knight C6, Knight C3. Adiban plays uh, what is known now after knight of six as the four knights game and it's a rare guest at uh top levels and um you know there was a one time very uh way back in the early 1900s where this game was played uh you know uh with the white pieces and the masters uh you know played it to win you know it wasn't like a drawing weapon um uh, but nowadays, it's looked at as, uh, you know, a dull, lifeless uh, opening. Uh, solid, of course, if you want to make a draw. But just the uh, lack of threats in general, the symmetry in the position, uh, you know, just allows too little chance for the initiative. And that's the uh, reason why it's not seen at uh, top levels. Now, at lower levels... Uh, it's a different story. A different story. Okay, so let's keep going. D4. E takes D4. Knight takes D4. Now, D4. Um, D4 is not the uh, the only continuation here. Uh, after Knight F6. Bishop B5 can be played and bishop b4 continuing on with the symmetry castle castles d3 d6 bishop g5 and now you see what i'm talking about with the symmetry however at this point black uh should not continue on with the symmetry symmetry in theory has bishop takes c3 here Preventing this knight from hopping uh, to d5, um, putting a pin there. Okay. And uh, bishop b4 is known as the Spanish uh, four knights game. So back to the continuation. Uh, d4 is known as the Scotch four knights variation because of its similarity uh, to that. After e takes d4, knight takes d4 was play, played. But an interesting continuation is known as the uh, Belgrade Gambit, which uh, starts after knight d5. And play, for instance, can get very sharp after knight takes e4, queen e2 with the pin, f5, knight g5, trying to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, dislodge this knight here. I'm sorry, d3, and d3 sacrifices the pawn back to clear um, the way for knight d4, sorry for not mentioning that, d3, c takes d3, and now knight d4, hitting the queen and, and breaking this pin here, queen h5 check, g6, Queen h4, c6, now d takes e4, and c takes d5. And uh, as you can see by that sample line, one would want to be prepared to go into that, especially if you are uh, black. Many players uh, deal with the, the uh, Belgrade Gambit by simply um, after... E takes d5, you know, unprepared players. The knight d4, um, knight takes d5. Instead of taking the challenge up from white, grabbing this pawn, they just simply play a move like bishop uh, e7. And for example, bishop f4, d6, knight takes d4, knight d5, e takes d5, knight takes. A bunch of pieces get traded off. 
5 check, bishop d7, queen e3 check, and queen e7 has been known uh, for a long time to produce uh, equality. So if you're not up for that uh, that sharp line, then you can always opt for this. Okay, but the Belgrade Gambit was not uh, tried out here. And um, we have a traditional Scotch 4 knight variation. So knight takes d4. Bishop b5, I'm sorry, bishop b4, excuse me, with the pin here, indirectly uh, attacking the e-pawn. And you see that black gets an uh, initiative here. He gets a slight initiative here. In, in exchange uh, for, uh, for giving up the initiative, white gets to damage black's pawn structure. All right, and tends to try to play against those uh, weaknesses. Black tries to play dynamically in order to offset uh, the weaknesses that he's uh, obtained structurally as a result. So bishop b4, knight takes c6, so now you see the pawn structure being damaged. b takes c6, notice that this pawn is still under threat. So bishop d3, d5, still threatening the pawn. Finally, White has to uh, give up the center. And now Carlson Castles. Also possible and normal is, is C takes D5 uh, right away. Castles. And Castles by uh, Adiban. And now Carl Carlson picks up the pawn. Okay, so C takes D5. Bishop G5. So now the tides have turned and now black, excuse me, white is attacking black center now. C6. And this is basically a main tabia uh, of the four knights uh, scotch variation. Um, there's different moves here, but this is basically one of the main positions. You'll get this queen coming here with the idea of doubling up these pawns. Sometimes this knight will go here with the idea of um, uh, landing in c5 also playing move c3 and to fix these pawns as weaknesses and targets so there's different plans sometimes this knight will also go here to e2 and then end up on f4 but this plan played by white is one of the uh, main uh, plans he simply goes queen f3 bishop d6 and again, notice how black is not concerned about his pawns being doubled because he'll have the bishop here. All right, that's a common uh, trade-off. Bishop e7 is playable, but it's it's kind of passive. But some players don't like to get their pawns uh, destroyed. But this is the way most of the uh, games you'll see will go. Is uh, white often ignores, excuse me, black often ignores the uh, threat to double the pawns. So bishop d6, rook a e1, going to the open b file. And notice how I said before how basically in turn in uh, exchange for the damaged pawn structure, black tends to get more active and dynamic play. And that's that's how he plays. Whereas white is trying to just have a static advantage. Notice how um, uh, perfect the white pawn structure is. So he's basically trying to just maintain a small positional advantage and grind white up uh, black down in the ending. B3. A5 from Magnus Carlsen. H3. Again, just trying to restrict the scope of this bishop here. H6. And Magnus even provokes the exchange. Bishop takes f6, queen takes f6, queen takes f6, and now g takes f6. All right. So having all of these pawn weaknesses is one thing, but to exploit them is another. Knight e2, and this is the plan I was telling you about before, the knight dropping back here. c5. These hanging pawns give uh, black a lot of control in the center. This is part of the compensation 
uh, ladies and gentlemen, for the uh, ruined pawn structure. All right, it's really important for Black to make sure he stays active and that he uh, uses his trumps in the position, which is the central pawns to dominate the center and use the open files and the bishop pair to stay active. So, so white can't just sit down and um, start attacking all of these weak pawns. Knight g3. You know where that knight is going. It's two squares. Either here or here. Alright. Rook goes to d8. <coughs> Excuse me. Knight f5. Good move by Magnus. Now he could have played bishop uh, takes f5 here. However, he wants to preserve his bishops right now. So he keeps the bishop here. Knight e7. So now Adiban guarantees that he will obtain a bishop pair because there's a fork here. So bishop takes e7. Rook comes down to the seventh rank. And this is what this is good for white. This is what white wants. Is now he's on the seventh rank. He wants to start probing here, attacking all of these uh these pawns. Bishop e6, nice move by Magnus Carlsen, preventing the doubling of rooks uh, on the 7th rank. So he kind of like traps the rook uh, behind enemy lines, uh, so to speak. So this was his idea, this was uh, Carlsen's idea in not playing uh, bishop takes f5 and simply uh, just allowing uh, uh, white to make the trade by playing knight e7. Is to trap the the rook in behind enemy lines. So rook d1 and c4. So now it's time uh, to push the pawns and create weakness in White's camp. And another thing to think of too is notice how Magnus considers all of his pieces in the equation how they would be active. Right now, this rook right here that I have highlighted, uh, you know, would love to be able to penetrate down this file. You know, if we could get it opened up. So, Magnus plays the move c4 in mind. Attacking a bishop and threatening to exchange bishop e2. Of course, um, this is white's major trump in the position. Is this pristine pawn structure and he tries to keep everything together. Dynamic play by Magnus. Just willing to sacrifice a pawn. So now, um, Adiban really has no choice. Now the file is open. Good instructive play by Magnus. B takes a4. Bishop f5. He just keeps keeps on attacking. Right? He didn't run. He didn't rush. And then now he just simply improves the bishop. Bishop f3. D4. This, ladies and gentlemen, is called attacking a moving target. And that's what happened. The target just moves. D4. A5. Of course, Adiban is dreaming to use these pieces to help escort this pawn down the uh, A file. Magnus takes, and now you have these two dangerous past pawns. Now, who would have thought, right? If you figure like five or ten moves ago, that you that black will have two pass pawns running down the C and D files. That is Magnus for you though. Rook C1. Rook B1. So now the rook that's been sitting on B8 that whole time is now finally involved itself in a meaningful way. Bishop takes B1 by exchanging off uh, White's rook on the first rank and gaining a tempo for the bishop. Rook c7, again attacking a moving target, just simply moves up. How else are you going to stop this? Now Magnus just goes to pick up these prisoners over here. Rook c5, bishop takes a2, bishop c2, bishop e6, preparing uh, for the final assault 
which is basically the free free up the advance for these pawns. And after King F1, Rook C8, very powerful move. Rook takes, Bishop takes, and of course, don't want the king to get in there. Just in time, Bishop A6 check. And at the king F3, D3, Adiban had enough and simply resigned. A uh, fantastic game by Magnus. Uh, reminds me of, of Fisher in so many ways. Just the uh, simplicity and logic of all the moves. Very easy to grasp, but very difficult to duplicate in, in uh, over the board play. But when you're looking at the games, it looks so simple. And that is a, a mark of greatness. So I hope you enjoyed that video. I'll see you guys on the next one.